Then something woke you, didn't it? Was it a dream? What was it? I heard a strange noise. What was it? It was... screaming. Some kind of screaming, like a child. rocket science. In this episode we're going to just deal with perspective and context but for once not uh, of a particular criminal or criminal case but basically um, the perspective of true crime rocket science in terms of 2019 and then also going into 2020 but also your perspective. Um, this is an opportunity to look back on the previous year, both within the context of true crime and beyond it, and then also to take that context into the future. What lessons do we learn from 2019, not only from what we've paid attention to, but just what has happened in our lives that um, have mattered to us. And so, as I go through the highlights and lowlights of 2019, both in terms of my work and in terms of my personal life, I want to invite you to kind of do the same. Um, it's not, I'm not trying to be self-indulgent and, you know, share with or gloat or, or whatever about certain things. The whole idea is to look back on a year and, and say, what is the most important or meaningful aspect in the year? And then, take that into the next year and say, well, maybe I need to be doing more of this or that in the next year if I want a, a more meaningful year. Also, what were the aspects that were less meaningful and what can one learn from that? And then also, um, just in a kind of a general sense, not such a serious sense, just looking at the, um, the focus of true crime rocket science over the past year and where it's going to go in the future. And of course, it would be good to get your input on that. I mean, um, obviously, it matters what you guys want and what you guys think. Um, so this is your opportunity to um, let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want more of and what you want less of, um, not only in terms of um, books that have been written, but also um, the content on this channel. Before we get to that, I just want to touch on the clip that I played at the beginning of this episode. It is obviously um, Sir Anthony Hopkins in the role of Hannibal Lecter. He actually won an Oscar for that role. And um, Jodie Foster in the role of FBI agent Clarice Starling in The Silence of the Lands from 1991. And so what happens in this scene, which is perhaps the best scene in the, in the movie, is there's kind of a quid pro quo situation where the FBI agent wants information from Hannibal Lecter. He's kind of an expert in the criminal mind. He's actually a, um, I think he's a psychologist himself. He's, he's, he's sort of got education as a psychologist um, or in psychology. And so she, she approaches him for basically his true crime rocket science version of, you know, a profile of a particular person. But in exchange for this information, Hannibal Lecter wants something from, from Clarice starting, he sort of wants a peek into her mind, kind of at the most vulnerable moment. And she doesn't want to give this information to him because it's um, personal and it's something that could get her into trouble, especially with someone as dangerous as he is. But then he kind of insists and then she talks about a particular night in her life that... Um, 
that the title of the film um, actually uh, draws its its name from. Um, and so what you get in this sort of just the simple scene is Hannibal Lecter, in order to advance the narrative for the FBI in terms of the case they're investigating, he wants to go back in time and get his own information about this particular agent. And I just think it's a really interesting um, way that, that this scene sort of hinges on the the future being predicated on the past on, and on maybe someone else's past and just the transactionality between all that. I just find that a very interesting kind of interchange um, and kind of exchange. And I just want you to bear that in mind when we go sort of through um, this episode, just how the past kind of handshakes with the future and vice versa. Okay, and so without further ado, let's get started. So my highlights for 2019 were wholly unexpected. Um, I didn't plan on the first and the best and the biggest highlight, I guess, which was a mountain bike event called the Karoo to Coast. It's around about 96 kilometers. It's about 60 miles. Um, from a little town called Uniondale to the pretty coastal town of Nisna in South Africa. Um, why it was a big deal to me was, first of all, um, it was a totally spontaneous thing. I hadn't really trained. Um, I hadn't, to be honest, I hadn't really been on my mountain bike before this particular race. Also, I'd never ridden a mountain race before in my life, um, which is quite ironic since I actually built a couple of mountain bike courses um, when I was a student at university. Um, I am obviously a, a serious cyclist. Um, I've done the Ironman, I've done many half Ironmans, um, many, many cycle races, including the uh, Cape Arga cycle tour. So, so I'm, you know, I'm not new to cycling, but um, I'm definitely an amateur when it comes to mountain biking. and. I was on quite a long training ride with some friends of mine and one guy sort of just mentioned casually that he was doing the Karoo to Coast and since I'd just published a book and I was wanting a break from the keyboard and just wanting um, a little holiday I guess, just something completely different, um, I thought that would be awesome, I would, I would love to just go and do this race. And um, there's a lot more to the story. Uh, the guy that I was talking to, I'd been, um, I'd, I'd sort of been at a bachelor's party, or whatever you want to call it, a bachelor's get together on a on a fishing boat, and I'd gotten quite sick, and all the guys had sort of, you know, been very, um, you know, that caught fish very well. I, I think I'd caught the first fish, but from then on I didn't feel very well. But in any event, I felt quite emasculated by the whole thing. And and the fact that this guy was doing this race, I think I think some of it was also just wanting to um, um, restore a little bit of that aspect. There definitely was, I think, an ego aspect. But there was also just wanting to do something different and wanting to do something challenging and all that kind of thing. And it turned out to be very, very, very challenging. Um, as I said, never done a mountain bike race before. This one was hard anyway, just because of the distance. Um, and it was also, look, 94, 96 kilometers on a mountain bike is totally different to 96 kilometers on a time trial bike or a racing bike. It, 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 feels about two or three times further if not more and so yeah the race started very hard it, it was pouring with rain it was, a, it was cold um, a cold front moved over while we were riding so we had rain uh, there was literally snow that was falling not on us but i think it felt over fell overnight it did rain it did rain on us quite a few times very cold rain and also hail and um, wind, the sun came out a few times, went away, went behind clouds. It was a very weird day, but also a very, very tough day. And a lot of people just gave up and 
sort of got onto trucks and there were there was a constant stream of trucks kind of from halfway where people had just given up and I'd kind of set in my mind that I wanted to do this and so giving up for me wasn't an option and so it was a very tough day there's I could go on I could make a whole episode just about that day but yeah it was a very hard day and I really had to grit my teeth and for about four weeks after the event um, I still felt that the ends of my fingers um, didn't have any feelings in them. Uh, in the beginning I thought it was not frostbite but a kind of cold uh, induced nerve damage and I later found out that it was actually because of the vibrations of the bike going downhill like at, at speed and there were some sections that were about I think like 15 kilometers worth of downhill um, you know you, you've got to you've got to break otherwise you, you know, go too fast and, and the corrugations in the tracks and, and rocks and all, all sorts of things and yeah so I kind of had nerve damage to the ends of my fingers that that lingered for around about five six weeks and it's kind of a funny feeling when I came back from the trip um, getting back to my keyboard and not actually being able to feel the keyboard under my fingers just both a kind of a feeling of um, almost sadistic achievement um, and or maybe masochistic achievement just that you know I'd, I'd kind of hurt myself and I've pushed myself that hard but also just weird to be typing and not quite feeling the, the, the keys under my fingers the feeling has since come back although there's a, just a slight rawness to some of my fingers like like the pinky but um, you know, I sort of feel it was worth it. It was a, it was an adventure. It was quite a, a, quite a difference, being you know in one's office writing books one minute and then the next being completely in the outdoors and completely um, kissed, and shoved by the, the wind and the rain. You know, for hours on end. And as it turned out, this guy that I'd felt kind of emasculated by, obviously he he wasn't ugly or nasty about it I just felt a bit embarrassed about how weak I'd been on that fishing but I just started getting quite sick and wanted to go back to shore and all that kind of thing and in this race I sort of just wanted to do something um, with muscles and with um, you know one's inner being one's inner being but in a physical sense rather than just using your mind all the time and it turned out I, I needed my mind to get me through that day and as it turned out, he was one of thousands who, who gave up on that day. I actually think he was sick, so it's not as though he wouldn't have been able to do it anyway. But he had he had he had quite a torrid time. He he had punctures and um and I think he I think he was in hospital a day or two after the race, just from you know whatever he was going through. So. So anyway, that was really the, the highlight for me of 2019 was this very hard day and I just felt really um, there was an incredible sense of achievement um, when I came into the sort of finishing stretch. Um, and I think the last time I felt that sense of exhaustion coupled with um, not ecstasy, but um, just a sense of being happy with what one has been able to do um, was when I did the Ironman in I think 2005 so so you know it's not such a big deal uh, the 84 90, 94 95 96 kilometer uh, mountain bike race but the fact that I'd never ridden on a mountain bike in a race never mind that far for me it ended up being a real challenge and so it was good to be able to set the challenge and meet it um, I guess in the physical sense um, you know, if you had to ask me what is harder you know riding a book or riding that mountain bike race I think I would say riding that mountain bike race um, so that should give you an idea um, so yeah, that was definitely a highlight. Unfortunately, right next to it was a low light. Um, the fact that I um, try to, because you're riding from A to B um, and my car was at A, I needed to arrange transport back after 
cycling that whole way and I'm not going to go into it because it's a real bummer but um, uh, the people that I arranged with just didn't really pitch up and so I arrived I started the race at about 8 and I finished it at about um, 5 o'clock so it was about 9 hours that I was in the dirt and mud and rain and whatnot. And then when I got to the end, uh, the people that I'd asked to bring, you know, fetch me, um, pick me up, um, weren't there. And uh, unfortunately, they only arrived at 10 o'clock that night. So, so it was a five-hour wait in this sort of very cold weather uh, and in the rain, uh, covered in mud. Um, obviously, starting to get really, really hungry after the race, and that was not fun so this incredible highlight was immediately um i won't say it was scratched out but i just felt quite just kind of heartbreaking to have such a great day um sort of stamped out by someone that you you know made an arrangement with who just took their time you know coming to pick you up so i really felt angry and betrayed by that and I'm, I'm still pretty angry about it but you know that's that's how it goes um so that's that's also the low light i guess of 2019 was what it was what immediately followed that race uh, unfortunately um and um i don't know it just um gave me a sense of who can you rely on you know <laughs> so so that was just not fun um then i did another race a little bit later this time on the road it was called a, a Shell V Power race. It was um, interestingly the the mountain bike race was was sort of um, touted as 100 kilometers, but it was only 96. And this V Power race on the road was touted as um, 100, but it was actually about 106 kilometers. And um, that was just such an amazing race just because if the mountain bike race I felt slow and lumbering and just you know I was just um, hanging on by a thread in, in some um, cases on some climbs this um, Shell V power I really felt strong um, I really think I raced very well I think I've kind of raced the perfect race given my um, preparation um, I basically gave pretty much 99.9 percent .9%. it was it was just um, I just felt like I've executed it um, very um, well very tactically very well and physically very well just that I paced myself very well so that was definitely a highlight with with no low light afterwards and then I think um, the third highlight was the trip to Europe uh, in the first um, quarter of 2019 um, where I went to Portugal, France and the Netherlands. I'd never been to Portugal before and I'd never been to the Netherlands before and I'm actually Dutch, I'm, I'm from D Dutch ancestry. So yeah, the, the, the last leg of that trip was um, very kind of a spiritual experience for me in, in, in many ways, in many ways that were actually quite deep. Um, but the trip started off in Portugal and um, I actually started by um, staying in Praia de Luz and basically doing a in-situ um, investigation of the, the crime scene um, surrounding apartment 5A. In fact, I was there. I was at um, the Ocean Club um, on the night of um, May 3rd. And I did some experiments and I did some on the ground research literally and I took notes and photos and so on and um, that's something I want to um, put put into a book called uh, Deeper Into Darkness. So I've written a book called Deep Into Darkness and that book ends um, prior to, I wrote that book just before I went to Portugal. So deeper into darkness which um, hopefully will come out in 2020 um, talks about the, the insights that I got having written four books on the McCann case um, what did I learn by actually being there 
And so that's pretty interesting. I mean, that, the night that I was there, um, retracing the steps was very, very, very interesting. And um, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm dealing with in Deep Into Darkness. Uh, in line with that, I'm doing a series of, of episodes on this channel dealing with the Netflix documentary, the 10 part documentary. It was actually recently voted as the number one documentary on, on Netflix. Um, so, so I think there's quite a lot to talk about there. So I'm going to be going through the reviews that an analysis that I've, I've put together. Um, in a series on this channel, so look out for that. Um, but then I also went to France uh, after that, and I literally retraced the journey of uh, Vincent van Gogh. And in South Africa and the Netherlands is van Gogh, not van Gogh. Um, but um, yeah, so when I was there, that was also just a very meaningful journey that I took. Um, I visited where his yellow house used to be in all and then I went by train also retracing the journey that he took in the summer of 1890 in June the last two months of his life and then he went up to Auvers sur in um, sort of north of Paris um, also went to Paris when I was there and um, yeah I looked at um, his grave and uh, the various sites that he painted and I actually ate at the restaurant where he ate it and where he stayed and um, that's a journey I'm going to be taking you guys through also on this channel um, in June and July um, of, of this year commemorating the uh, last journey of Vincent van Gogh and um, you know, that's on the 130 year anniversary of his death. So I'm looking forward to doing that. There's also a chance that I might be going back to the Netherlands um, this year to continue what I was doing when I was there um, last year. Um, but um, that's also kind of part of a highlight and a, and a bummer. Um, but I'll tell you more about that during the series. Then, um, in terms of true crime, um, the the way that I found out about the Bloody Valentine documentary was, was quite funny. Um, I was obviously trying to set up this YouTube channel and and then I remembered that, you know, a, a crew had come into my home and, and recorded me for hours. I think it was over three hours um, that they just interviewed me and asked me to respond to questions and ideas and, and, and certain things. And, um, and I'd always sort of wondered what, what had ever happened to that. And then I thought it had just been left on the cutting room floor. And um, so on a whim, I contacted the producer and the producer said, no, it's coming out early next year um, on Netflix. Um, that's what he said. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I don't know whether it's going to not come out and maybe come out later, but that is what the producer told me. Um, I don't know whether he's going to produce it in some kind of different way, but um, I'm certainly looking forward to what I've seen. I know he's interviewed quite a few um experts um, and also very well respected journalists so yeah that'll be that'll certainly be a shot in the arm for for me because um, I have a lot of people challenging my um, credibility and um, I think because I haven't appeared in a documentary people think I'm an amateur um, people because I self-published my books people think it's not as good as um, if I'd handed the book to a publisher um, and that's really nonsense because um, my books sell enough to employ me so if, if it was nonsense I, I wouldn't be able to do it for a living and also um, 
I choose not to go the publishing route just because it's so time consuming and tedious and laborious. And you know, if you want to bring out these narratives timelessly and um, sort of before everyone else and, and be competitive, then it doesn't help going the publishing route. Um, you know, I brought at least five or six books, uh, maybe even more, uh, before the first book was published on this case. And ironically, when the first books came out, people complained. Like they said, uh, you know, how can you know anything? That was their complaint. And that's the reason that I wrote them as quickly as I did, was to show this is how much you can know. And, um, you know, you sort of wonder what's going on. You know, people are interested in true crime. Then when you provide a narrative, they criticize you. Um, it's just odd. Um, you know, anyone is, if you don't like something, you, you're welcome to ignore it. You don't have to read something that you think is defective. Just don't. You don't need to listen to something or someone that you don't agree with. Just don't. Go somewhere where you think it's better. That's all. It's as simple as that. So, something else that was kind of a highlight that had nothing to do with um, physical activity or true crime was Avengers Endgame. Um, as a narrator, as a storyteller, as someone who writes for a living, I just found the way that um, Kevin Feige, the guy at the head of um, Marvel, the whole MCU, um, I just thought he did a great job in um, bringing out a series of, of movies, um, you know, in terms of the, the Marvel characters, the Captain America movies, the um, the Iron Man movies, the Thor movies, which I really enjoyed, and, and all the rest, and then putting them in a, in a kind of a... Um, kind of a package, almost like a box set, um, that culminated in the Avengers films and ultimately Avengers Endgame. And I just thought the intertextuality between the films, the cohesiveness, the the way that he built that whole franchise up, I thought was just done very well. And something that's missing in our very fragmented society, this um, continuity. Continuity is really what is missing. Uh, we, we are so disconnected um, and so to have stories that are um, that that resonate with one another and that continue and and that and, that, and where you have these very long story arcs is something that I think we need in our own lives. We, we need arcs to our own stories. We need um, an identity and a thread running through our own stories. And so, um, yeah, I was very impressed by what he did. I was impressed by the finale. And, and um, you know, even Disney and Star Wars can take a leaf out of his book just on how to work hard to... Um, to develop the identities of, of characters and make make you care about stories, right? And storytelling. And um, yeah, and, and that whole thing is going on. And bear in mind the whole Avengers franchise is the most valuable in cinema history. So it's it's really, really groundbreaking and just shows you how um, important it is again just for for stories to um, make sense and to be taken care of. You know, to care about your stories um, and, and know how to care about them. I mean, one could argue that with Star Wars, people haven't known how to care about a story. And you don't care about a story by by pandering to the public. And and um, that's one thing that I don't do. I don't I don't sort of sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a Chris Watts book. What does the public want? I write about what I think is important. Um, I care about what the public. Um, thinks about, but I'm certainly not pandering. And someone actually accused me on Reddit recently of intentionally misleading people. That just shows you how little these people know about, you know, what you're actually doing. You know, if that was the case, I think, you know, the books that, that uh, I wrote on Stephen Avery, you would definitely write them from the perspective that he was innocent. If you're, if you're pandering to the public, that's what you would do. 
I think another way you would pander to the public is, for example, on the McCann case, you would you would advance the um, paedophile abductor narrative because that's the popular narrative. That's the one that gets all the airplay, that gets repeated in the media. That's what um, the Netflix documentary is all about. So you know, if you wanted to pander, you could just put up your hand and say, yes, I've been saying that all along as well, and there's a paedophile abductor. It's not true, but if you wanted to sell books, if that was your your exclusive um, motive, then that's what you would do, wouldn't it? So it's a ridiculous thing to say, and um, frankly, it's um, it's not only misleading, but it is um, it's dishonest. It's a dishonest accusation. And so one thing I do want to ask you guys, if any of you guys are on the Reddit forum, there's a, there are a couple of moderators there who who've um, supported a um, a blog post that's literally accusing uh, me and my co-author of intentionally misleading the public in terms of the John Bernay Ramsey case, and the the the, um, the one moderator is adequate size attaché um, because of what this person's done on um, on Reddit, and I've asked her to remove the post, and she's insisted on keeping it up. This is a post accusing me of um, um, mislead, intentionally misleading the public. Um, I, I want to um, um, have this person um, pay damages for that particular accusation. And um, I just need that person's name so that I can send a, a letter from my attorney. So, um, just like in the Marvel movies, there are sometimes real consequences to real, to when you make certain statements about real people. And um, I take I take accusations like that 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 attack my credibility very, very, very seriously. I do this for a living, and I don't appreciate people. Uh, who are actually who actually tell lies in public, making claims about me personally and my work personally that aren't true, and I don't know whether they think it's a joke or whether they seriously believe what they believe, whether they think in their opinion it's valid, but it's not valid. I don't anywhere um, make claims to sell books or whatever, um, make. Um, um, uh, false claims that I know are, aren't true to sell books. I don't do that anywhere and I've never done it anywhere. So someone saying that I'm doing that um, actually needs to be taken to task. So if any of you are on the, that Reddit forum of John Bernay Ramsey and you know the forum moderator, adequate size attaché, and there's another moderator there as well, I've, contact, I've contacted them directly and I've asked them to take it down. They've refused to do so. In, instead, what they've done is banned me. Um, uh, please let me know. Like, if any of you, any of you listening, um, know who these people are, um, let me know because I'm. Um, I just need to 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 get the addresses of these people and and then um, and then institute uh, a claim. So. So. If you do know something, please, uh, you can contact me on um, Twitter direct message or, um, you know, various other ways. You can email me as well. Um, if you don't know, um, just keep your eyes open. If you're on those channels, just um, keep your, your eyes and ears open because they will eventually reveal the, the identities or someone else will. So it's just a matter of time. And I think that's definitely the, the early low light for 2020 was having to deal with that. And so <laughs> let's uh, let's move on to something else. Um, uh, my five best books, I think, from 2019, I think are mostly the last few. I think Oblivion was um, probably the best book I've written so far on Chris Watts. And I think one of the reasons why Oblivion was such a good narrative was, I mean, that's the book I wrote when I came back from Europe. I literally came back from Europe 
um, in the last couple of days of um, of May, so it was something like May 28th, and then I think on June 8th, Oblivion was published. So I was really refreshed and my mind was strong and um, I was just very invigorated by that experience. And so, um, and I'd obviously accumulated a lot uh, more thoughts and ideas on the Chris Watts case after, um, after the seven books that had gone on before. I mean, I think when I went to... Um, when I went to Europe, um, I sort of felt like I'd, I was done with the Chris Watts case. You know, I'd written seven books and I was kind of done. And then um, Oblivion um, Oblivion sort of went further than Annihilation, which was basically just talking about what Watts had said during his second confession. And Oblivion went further and just said um, what was true in the second confession and what wasn't what did actually happen and so oblivion is um probably the um one of the best books to read if you want to get the true crime rock science version the final version of what what um, what happened in the chris watts case and it's not the version that everybody believes again um if i wanted to be popular and i wanted to sell books in some kind of cynical mercenary dishonest way when i just say something like you know there, there are other books about chris watts that are out there like letters for christopher and and, and the other one peddling the narcissism thing if i wanted to make money if, if i wanted to manipulate people to make money by by lying to them then wouldn't i talk about narcissism all the time and also say that what Chris Watts had said about killing the children at the well site was true because that's what most people seem to believe. So wouldn't that be good for me if that's what I wanted to do? If I wanted to, if I wanted to sell books, wouldn't I do that? So why am I not doing it? Because it's not what I believe happened. And that's why you can trust this channel. Um, far more than, than uh, so many of the other channels that are out there. Um, what I think is quite amazing is that having stuck to this rare commodity, which is the truth or what appears to be true, as unpopular as it is, it's certainly been enough to get people to, to buy into it. Truth is really a, a rare commodity out there. You've got to ask yourself, you know, who can you trust? Who can you rely on? And I mean, I was in that same boat after that mountain bike race. Where it was just, you know, and the answer is the best person you can trust and rely on is yourself. But then you must also make up your mind um, who is trustworthy and why. So, yeah, so I would say Oblivion is... Um, was one of the best books that I wrote in 2019. Um, I also rate Incel very highly. It was a extremely difficult book to write. Um, what I was trying to do was tell the Incel story, but um, but also telling two stories at the same time. So I was first telling the overarching story of Elliot Roger and his sort of killing spree rampage through Isla Vista in California. So I was telling that story and then also telling the stories of other incels. And I must say, I learned quite a lot about the human condition and myself just through that narrative in, in ways that I couldn't have predicted. Um, that was definitely um, a learning curve for me, writing that book. In the same way that Slaughter was as well. Um, both those books, Incel and Slaughter, taught me so much about true crime and the criminal mind. Um, another book that um, nobody cared about and not many people read, but a book that um, was also very difficult to write and very um, heartbreaking on so many levels was Not All Who Wander Are Lost, the story of um, Nora Curran's um, disappearance in Malaysia. 
I think the reason that book meant a lot to me was um, because I've been to Malaysia. I've, be, I've um, I stayed in a hotel overnight in Kuala Lumpur, I think, over sort of a New Year's period. Um, I've I've, I've travelled a little bit through Malaysia, including visit, visiting one particular island uh, with with a French um, companion. <coughs> companion, <coughs> sorry. So I sort of feel like I know Malaysia quite well, um, and um, there was a really important message that I wanted to communicate through this particular narrative, and it it was it really. It really um, explicates just how damaging the John the um, Madeleine McCann case is to the whole true crime genre because and in a way the John Benet Ramsey case as well because you have these two these two cases that that sort of set up on the, on the world stage the one sets up the idea of a um, paedophile intruder. Right, and so the whole world is now worried that that the, the paedophiles running around, lurking in the neighbourhood. You know, every every neighbour is probably a paedophile because of that that story. And then in the McCann case, it's reinforced with a paedophile abductor. If you go on holiday, um, take care of your children because the paedophiles running on the beach. Um, you know, that's um, paedophiles are lurking. Um, you know, if you're if you're on a beach and there's there's a stranger lying on a towel, um, you know, ten feet from you, it might be a paedophile. Beware, beware. And and um, that is the psychology psychology that was taken into the disappearance of Nora Curran. And uh, I'm not not pronouncing her surname right, but um, and the whole thing being that um, because they treated her disappearance as, a, a, as an abduction, as a kidnapping. They decided to search far and wide for her. Meanwhile, she was stumbling around right in front of the hotel, lost. And this is a girl with, who was disabled. And again, because of the ridiculous um, um, frenzy around, you know, this is a, an abduction, with, with maybe some kind of sexual motive, um, they, they, they went far afield into villages far away looking for some kind of um, paedophile kidnapper. Meanwhile, as I say, this little girl is walking around the woods right around the hotel and she walks ends up walking around for um, nine, ten days and eventually starves to death. And then when they discover her body, there's no signs of any kind of sexual assault. But the parents still insist that there's foul play. And they insist that she was abducted. And they insist that um, there's some kind of criminal component to it. And so I feel really strongly about just how damaged... And, and the, the McCann narrative came into the, this case um, of, of Nora... Um, where the parents were talking about it, the the media were talking about it. Is this the next Madeleine McCann, whatever? And it wasn't helpful. It wasn't helpful to think about some kind of um, uh, attacker or intruder or whatever. Again, you're not going to have an intruder breaking into an apartment when everyone's inside sleeping. You could just wait for her to be walking outside or something like that. Aside from that, there was just no evidence that there'd been a, a, a break-in. There's absolutely no evidence except a window that's open, just like in the Ramsey case. And then as recently as I think December, the, the parents, Nora's parents, uh, went into the media saying... They've conducted a second autopsy and they're waiting for the toxicology report. And they're still talking up the um, the story of foul play. They're still saying there's a criminal element in the case. And the, that's not what the police say. The police say there's no sign of a criminal element. 
And so you've got to ask yourself, why are the parents insisting that there's a criminal element to what happened to their child? And it's essentially exactly the same thing that the Ramses and the McCanns were saying about their children, that there's some foreign, alien, um, intruder element that, that, that has happened to their child. That's what happened. It had nothing to do with them. It's some unknown, invisible phantom that, that did whatever they did. It's not anything they did. It's, it's some phantom. Look towards the phantom. Th there you'll get your answers, right? So besides oblivion, incel, and not all who wonder are lost, um, I think Murder Most Foul was also one of my best narratives. Some, some of my readers have said it's one of the best books I've ever written. Um, I, I always find it ironic when people say that and then you see it's been reviewed four times or, or whatever it is. Um, and that's something I want to appeal to you guys. If you've read a book that I've written and however you feel about it, if, you, if you've enjoyed it, please review it. If you've hated it, please review it. But whatever you do, please leave reviews. Please get into the habit of leaving a review. Um, I promote my books using your reviews. Even if you leave a negative review, um, I might occasionally talk about what you say in the review and, and um, explain something or whatever it is. So it's so important to leave a review. The more reviews you leave, the more my books get a kind of credibility of its own, which, which basically just says many people have read this book, right? Um, and I sort of jealously look at Cheryl and Cadle's book, even though it's got a 2.5 out of 5 um, rating, um, I think it's been reviewed over 300 times, whereas my first book's barely been reviewed 70 times. So I'm very aware of that and um, it means a lot to me whenever I get a review. It's, it's something that I look out for every day. So part of my daily ritual is, um, you know, getting out of bed, um, going to my office, opening up my computer. And the first thing I look for is, are there any new reviews? And invariably they're not. Even though I've got so many books out there, um, it seems to take quite a long time for the reviews to come through and so each each review that I do get I there's a little bit of a um, it's a little bit of a thrill each because there are so few of them this new book uh, my daddy's a hero I think has already got 66 reviews or 67 reviews it's um, you know, it's it, it's humbling to me having, um, you know, I've written so many books and I think the book that's been reviewed the most is um, the first Chris Watts book and it's now only at 71 reviews. Yes, someone else has brought out her book and um, looks like it's her first book ever, I think, and it's it's almost being reviewed as much as my most reviewed book ever. It's It's incredibly humbling. It's also kind of depressing, um, and that's why I feel it's important to, you know, uh, step up the credibility game. You know, um, maybe get to um, get to America later this year. Um, speak to some people, um, and um, and then yeah, you know, appearing in Bloody Valentine um, will probably do a lot for me. Um, much needed. In that respect, um, I, I, like I say, I think people laugh at the fact that a book is self-published. They say, oh, well, then it can't be any good. Um, but it is the self-published work of a full-time, previously full-time um, photojournalist. And, and all that work, you could say, is, is essentially self-published. When a photojournalist sends an article to a publication, they well, in, certainly in my experience, they tend to publish it as is. There are a few little edits, getting rid of typos and so on, but they basically my work has always been published just the way it's been written. And so 
to say it's self-published to me is a bit of a joke. Um, it's published. Um, it's the, the published work of someone who's been published in literally dozens of magazines. So, anyway, it's a bit tedious to be going through all of that stuff. Um, yeah, but it, it obviously is something that I've still got to live with and still got to deal with. Um, you know, the those people who don't know me who just keep um, criticizing me. So. Um, so, yeah, Murder Most Foul, I think, was um, really a, a good book um, in terms of capturing the whole narrative, the whole arc of the Frazee case in one book. And so that's one aspect that you don't always get in, in, um, in the series that I write sometimes, especially if you're writing a series as it's happening, So that, like the Chris Watts case. It's a real-time series, then um, you're not getting that whole arc in one narrative, and that makes Murder Most Fall quite a strong narrative. Is that it came after the fact, and it just puts the whole story into one narrative, and um, and that's why I think it's quite a powerful analysis. And then I didn't expect this. Um, you know, Christmas Star, the last book that I wrote um, in 2019, was really meant to be kind of like a long blog post. Um, to be honest, how it came about was I looked at the blog post I posted earlier about um, the last photo, and I'd actually assumed that I'd explained in that blog post the significance of the last photo, but I remember what happened was in this blog post that was meant to be just a blog post about the last photo. As I wrote the blog post, just thinking, I'm not going to give this information away. It's too important. It's too significant. And uh, and I think three quarters through that blog post, I changed my mind and I decided not to. Uh, reveal the, the significance of the the bow in John Bonet's hair in that last photo. And so I thought I would just be doing kind of a long uh, blog post as, as a book, maybe five to ten thousand words. And so Christmas Star was meant to be written over two or three days and that was it. And it ended up being a quite a comprehensive um, book. Um, I dealt with the with the bow quite extensively and, and I, I learned quite a lot just from that simple book and it, it ended up being about seven took about seven days to write 25,000 words and um, it turned out to be quite a strong narrative on its own and strong enough for me to to count it in the top five books I think I, I wrote in 2019 so in 2020 um, I think quite a few exciting things are on the cards. Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing are audio books on Patreon. So I'm, uh, instead of um, recording audio books for Amazon, which is what I originally thought I was going to do, uh, I think I'm going to start by putting them on Patreon. Um, then there's also the trip to the USA, which I'll talk about. Uh, more about in due course. Um, I'm also really excited about hitting the 100 book milestone in 2020. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, and I'm also looking forward to transitioning away from um, so much book writing to other things. Um, hopefully the Bloody Valentine documentary will lead to other TV appearances and things like that. And, and then there's Patreon. I, I must say I'm quite enjoying that. I'm enjoying um, being paid for my content and I'm enjoying the crowd there. And I'm looking forward to producing more and better content on Patreon. And so there are a bunch of um, uh, projects that I'm doing on Patreon. There's the Atkinson transcripts. We're already at uh, episode 5 of 15. Um, there's some in-depth analysis of the John Bonet case that I feel is a bit too sensitive just for YouTube. There's also the um, the de debunking of the Netflix series. I think I'm going to put up 
maybe the first three uh, episodes on YouTube and then I'll put the last seven on Patreon. So I think I'll do it like that. And um, and then, yeah, like a couple of books that are likely to come out in 2020 are two more books on Chris Watts. Um, the one is Silver Fox, Wedded Husband, Wedded Wife, which should come out um, towards the end of January, um, maybe early February. And then um, Post Truth, which will come out much later than that, maybe um, around about June, July. And then besides that, I'm not sure exactly what the other books are going to be, um, but um, I have four, four books left to write to reach the 100 uh, milestone, and two of them are, are going to be Chris Watts' books. The other two, as I say, I haven't um, completely made up my mind. Something else that I'm going to be dealing with on Patreon, um, although I might do a few teasers on YouTube, is the last journey of Vincent van Gogh and I will probably um, be doing that in June and July. So I will be taking you through the journey I took through Europe, retracing his steps. Um, this is on the 130th anniversary, um, uh, around about June, July this year. So that's definitely something to look forward to. I may also go back to the Netherlands, um, but uh, that still remains to be seen. Okay, and I, I think that just about wraps it up. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about your highlights and lowlights of 2019 and and, um, and then also what you're looking forward to, especially from True Crime Rocket Science in 2020. So if you've got any thoughts, um, anything you want to point out, uh, please let me know. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. Um, I'm hoping to get to about 10,000 subscribers, uh, especially with the Madeleine McCann uh, series. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and um, yeah, if, they, if you have any suggestions for content that you'd want me to put up, I'll certainly consider them. As I said, um, what I would like from you is um, please uh, get into the habit of reviewing my books when you've read them. I get a lot of people contacting me on Facebook, on YouTube, on email and, and, and other channels as well, um, also by phone, telling me what a great book this was or whatever, and then they don't review the book. And it would mean so much, um, I'm not, <laughs> not going to say it would mean so much more, because I do appreciate your feedback, but it, it certainly would mean a lot when, you know, getting those reviews, you know, if, if you read a book and you really enjoy it, then then say so under the book. I mean, there's no better way of um, keeping me, you know, um, involved in writing the books than, than doing that. So one thing I can tell you is one of the ways that I stop writing a series of books is if a book gets less than five reviews, for example, then I just abandon the series just because I, I feel it's, it's not um, it's not going to be paying my bills and and I do um, I do do this full time so I do have to care about that you might say that's pandering to the public no it's survival it's economic survival so I do I do have to care about um, you know which narratives are working and um, there's certainly the narratives that I want to be covering and then the, the narratives that people want to be reading obviously it's um, can be quite bad for me if I say something and people disagree and then don't buy the book. But unfortunately, that's that's the risk that I take. Um, the Chris Watts case is a good example where I could have gone with um, the version that the children were killed at the well site. That's what he said. I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Um, and who knows, I could be wrong about that. It could be that that is what happened. It just doesn't make any sense if that is what he says. It just his version doesn't make any sense. And I know most people seem to believe that it does make sense, but it doesn't make any sense on many, many levels. Um, the children would have gotten hysterical if they were there alive, not only in terms of their mother, but also in terms of each other. So 
just doesn't make any sense I'm afraid um, and that's what you can expect from true crime rocket science if it doesn't make sense I'm going to tell you I'm going to be honest about it and um, it's got nothing to do with trying to sell things or be popular it's to do with true crime rocket science it's to do with an intelligent analysis of um, of the human condition and of these criminals and of how it can maybe apply to us and that's what I think you guys care about I care about it I'm sure you guys do too so thank you for listening and uh, I look forward to um, as many highlights as we can fit into this year um, hopefully we can fit in a few um, the year does seem to be off to a bit of a fourth start with the um, missile strike in Iraq quite strange that it's an Iranian commander struck in Iraq um, but uh, who knows maybe maybe things will will develop in a positive way there's a way we can make that happen and that's as I say by thinking about the past learning lessons from the past and if our leaders can't um, if our society won't well then at least we can we can try and that's what true crime rocket science is all about looking at cautionary tales and uh, learning the lessons not just for ourselves but for and on behalf of um, the human being and, and, and our society and it's a way that we can be the building blocks of a, a better society and I hope you'll join me in that in that mission which I think is a is a very um, edifying it's a very edifying thing to do is to try and build better communities uh, one individual at a time